Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. The lyric poem song Sweetest Love I Do Not Go um, is identified as a song, so it's likely to have been intended to have been set to music for performance. Dunn might have adopted the lyrical form in order to convey the harmony and consistency of his love. So let's take a look at the poem itself. Sweetest love, I do not go for weariness of thee, nor in hope the world can show a fitter love for me. But since that I must die at last, tis best to use myself in jest, thus by feigned deaths to die. Yesternight the sun went hence, and yet is here today. He hath no desire nor sense nor half so short a way. Then fear not me, but believe that I shall make speedier journeys, since I take more wings and spurs than he. Oh, how feeble is man's power, that if good fortune fall, cannot add another hour, nor a lost hour recall. But come bad chance, and we join to it our strength, and we teach it art and length, itself o'er us to advance. When thou sighest, thou sighest not wind, but sighest my soul away. When thou weepest, unkindly kind, my life's blood doth decay. It cannot be that thou lovest me, as thou sayest, if in thine my life thou waste, thou art the best of me. Let not thy divining heart forthink me any ill, destiny may take thy part, and may thy fears fulfil. But think that we are but turned aside to sleep, they who one another keep alive, ne'er parted be. So we need to recognise um, a little bit about the context of this poem. First of all, it's likely to have been written to Dunn's wife, Anne Moore. Most critics accept, therefore, that the poem was written in 1611, just before Dunn left her for an extended trip to France. And, of course, at that time, any sea voyage would be potentially dangerous, and his wife would have been uh, justified in being afraid for Dunn's safety. The poem acts, therefore, as a form of reassurance. The poem begins with the flattering superlative adjective, sweetest, which in itself provides some reassurance regarding the depth of the poetic voice's love for her. And despite his imminent departure, the poetic voice clarifies that he's not going because he's bored of his love for weariness of thee, nor because he hopes to find someone better, a fitter love. The stressed place at the beginning of each line, through the use of chockies like sweet, for, nor, serves to stress the poetic voice's conviction and therefore convey his sincerity. Sincerity is also represented through the relative simplicity of Dunn's language here. His word choices are frequently monosyllabic and usually pretty high frequency, certainly for Dunn. The second quatrain exhibits a tonal shift as Dunn moves from the emotional to the intellectual in terms of his arguments. His argument isn't particularly reassuring. He claims that since he'll eventually die anyway, it might be best to prepare for that fact by experiencing a pretense of death and therefore a temporary departure. It is also possible to interpret this quatrain as a sexual illusion, as is so often uh, the case in Dunn's work. Whenever he mentions die, you could see it as a euphemism for orgasm. Um, he does this frequently. He might be suggesting that his feigned deaths, drawing on that Elizabethan belief that uh, orgasm reduced life expectancy by a day, has already given his beloved a foreshadowing of death, and that this jest reveals that death is nothing to fear. She's experienced a, a minor death in the form of uh, sex with him, and therefore, you know, that's presumably a pleasurable experience, and therefore she shouldn't be worried about him literally dying. So Dunn uses the sun as a contrast to the poetic voice's fidelity. He says that the sun has also been on a journey, but his is much further than that which the poetic voice is about to embark on. Uh, Dunn has half so short a way. Despite this, the sun returns and can be relied upon to return. And given that the sun has got no desire to return, nor an intellect to guide him, no desire, nor sense, he still returns. And the implication of that is that since the poetic voice does possess desire, a wish to see his beloved, and sense, the ability to reason how to return, he's going to be more successful than the sun. And we always rely on the sun to return anyway, so he's going to be even more successful. 
He employs imperative verbs to insist that his addressee resists the temptation to fear. He's authoritative, he's convincing. And he makes allusions to mythical forms of speed to convey the urgency of the poetic voice's return. He's got more wings and spurs than the sun, a metaphor that links him to the Roman god Mercury, the messenger god and the god of travellers. Mercury is usually depicted with wings on his heels. Spurs are the items that are dug into the flank of a horse to make it move quickly, again suggesting that the poetic voice will travel more swiftly than the sun. Dunn's next argument is based on the frailty of humans and the significance of the psychological in terms of humans' appreciation of the world. He basically claims that if we're lucky or we're enjoying ourselves, we're unable to extend that period of time. It's the basic idea of time flies if you're having fun. And he might be using the consonants of fricatives to create a mocking tone, complementing that sense of man's frailty. In contrast, if we experience bad luck, we focus on it and we therefore make it more significant, extending the period of bad luck. Uh, by focusing on it, we join to it our strength. We're dwelling on the negatives, making them seem even worse. We allow the bad luck to defeat us. And Dunn employs the semantic field of battle to convey the way in which we help our enemy, bad chance. We allow it to advance by giving it our own strength and teaching it the skills to defeat us, what he'd refer to as art. He also employs syntactic parallelism in order to convey the multitude of ways in which we harm ourselves by psychologically devoting our energies to bad luck. The balance created by the parallelism may suggest the art that we afford bad luck. And that balance is complemented by the strong juxtaposed end rhymes, the lexical repetition and the paralleled assonance of our and art. Dunn suggesting basically that the poetic voice is beloved in considering the bad things that could happen to him is making matters worse for herself. Dunn takes the previous stanza's concept of the addressee making the situation worse for herself and extends it in the next stanza to suggest that she's also making it worse for him, for the poetic voice. When thou sighest, thou sighest not wind, but sighest my soul away. So the poetic voice is rejecting that conventional Petrarchan image of the lover's sigh being so intense that it's a metaphorical wind that could harm him at sea. Um, and this is an idea that he's employed in a number of poems, including perhaps most importantly, the final stanza of A Valediction of Weeping. Instead, he claims that because the lovers are one, her sighs reduce his soul. Uh, the idea, again, is very similar to that presented in A Valediction of Weeping. Since thou and I sigh one another's breath, whoever sighs most is cruelest. The Elizabethans believed that the soul was connected to the body through a form of um, invisible vapour. And Dunn exploits this by suggesting that the woman, by sighing, is expelling this vapour, making the soul gradually depart the body. And we can almost hear this through the uh, phonological technique that's employed. You've got this repetition of sighest and the attendant sibilance that's representing the sound of his lost breath, potentially. Dunn gives another example of this same concept through the use of weeping. If the woman cries because they are one, she allows their blood to decay by removing some of its constituent water. And again, Dunn might be using a phonological device to support this, um, that we've got this sense of connection through the consonants of de, unkindly, kind, my life's blood doth decay. So though that consonance, that hard consonance is connecting uh, each of the words in the same way that uh, their bloods are connected. Uh, the paradox of unkindly kind encapsulates that idea that the woman weeps out of kindness or love, um, but that such an act is ultimately unkind, given the effect that it has on both of them. So these are tears of love. They're, they're kind tears, but the weeping of them is unkind in terms of the effect on their relationship. He summarises the examples given in the first half of the stanza in, in this quatrain. They're intimately connected, she being the best of him, and as such, 
If she wastes her life through sighing and weeping, then she's wasting his life. When he states, let not thy divining heart, uh, divining is essentially foretelling, the ability to predict the future. And that synecdoche of heart reveals that the poetic voice identifies the woman's love as the source of her fears. Um, we've got this very clear identification of the heart, of course, with love. And it's interesting that Dunn's biographer, Isaac Walton, said of Anne Moore, she professed an unwillingness to allow him any absence from her, saying her divining soul boded her some ill in his absence and therefore desired him not to leave her. And so we hear an echo of that in this poem. If she imagines harm coming to him, the poetic voice claims that destiny may listen to these fears and fulfil them. And again, this is very reminiscent of a valed valediction of weeping. Let not the wind example find to do me more harm than it purposeth. So in conclusion, Dunn returns to the reassurance of the first stanza. The poetic voice urges the woman to imagine that during the separation, that we are but turned aside to sleep. That image provides a sense of close proximity and minimal separation. It's an image, therefore, of comfort. And by avoiding worries, sighs and tears, the woman can keep her lover safe. Given that they're one through their love, they can never be truly parted. And again, Dunn explores that same idea, but this time in a valediction forbidding mourning. So let's uh, end by taking a look at the structure. In terms of the stanzas, you've got five octaves and the regularity of those octaves could represent the enduring nature of their love. With the meter, we've got tri trochaic trimeter, with the second quatrain of each octave beginning with trochaic dimeter. And the strength of feeling could be captured by placing the stress at the beginning of each foot through those trochies. The rhyme scheme, we've got A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C. So it's um, a really limited range of rhymes, providing a really clear sense of connection, mirroring the connection of their love. And in terms of form, uh, as well as it being a lyric, it's dramatic monologue. And that gives Dunn the opportunity to present a deeply personal argument. OK, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.